it's Porsche Chen Silverberg. Welcome to You Belong Here, the place to be for positive stories of immigrant women from all around the world. You will meet inspiring women sharing their successes, challenges, and how they are living a meaningful American dream. You may even identify with some of their stories. I hope you will be inspired to take action, engage in new conversations, and join us in a beloved community of belonging. So we have a very special guest here today, Marie Salamanca. Hi, Maria. Hi. And Maria is such a special person because she's so young, but so accomplished already. Oh, thank you. <laughs> she, she was in last year's Forbes magazine's 30 Under 30 in Venture Capital. And she is an immigrant woman herself. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure thing. So I was born in Colombia, and my family has been in Colombia for uh, as long as I can remember. And we came to the U.S. when I was about six, seven years old. I just turned seven, I believe. And we moved to Orlando, Florida. Uh, at the time, Colombia was going through you know, kind of a rough patch, which most people know about it because of, of Netflix, Narcos. I don't know if you had a chance to see it. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a really popular show. Yeah, uh, it's I actually know it a is. great show. But, it is? Uh, yeah, it's actually pretty historically accurate. Wow. Uh, so props to Netflix for getting that right. Good to um, know. But yeah, so, you know, the 90s, from the 70s to the 90s, it was a very tough time in Colombia, a lot of economic hardship, a lot of violence. Um, a lot of kind of what's happening now in, in Latin America and Central America with, with Mexico and a lot of, of the drug um, lords that are really creating a lot of chaos around and, and it's really dangerous. So that has kind of moved up since then uh, from Colombia up. But back then it was it was Colombia that was terrible. So um, my family decided to move here for a variety of reasons. But when I was uh, six, seven years old, moved to Orlando, Florida. I was raised in Orlando, Florida from then until I decided uh, to venture all the way to the West for college. I came yeah. to Berkeley for, for college and, and kind of fell in love with Silicon Valley and stayed here. Mm, very nice. So what was it like when you were six or seven? Did you even know what it meant when your parents told you, hey, we're moving to America? I don't think so. So it was, it was super interesting because my parents, uh, we used to come to the U.S. all the time oh, uh, for, for summer vacation. And my parents loved to take my brothers to Disney. They were a little bit, they were older than I was. So I think okay. I got less of that than my brothers did. But, um, you know, we were coming and my, my parents didn't want me to know because they didn't want me to like freak out. Mm. And, and when you go through immigration and, and all that stuff. Um, they didn't want, you know, a six-year-old excited girl to be going around like, I'm moving to America. Right, right. Um, because it, it, for the most part, the the way that the refugee status really works is, is you come here and then you file once you get to the U.S. Um, and so they were just like, you know, we're going to Disney and you know, you're going to have a great time. And so I think it was maybe six months into being in the U.S. that I was like, why are we here so long? <laughs> uh, and then they're like, oh, yeah, we, we uh, you know, that uh, conversation with me about whether, you know, we're uh, actually thinking of staying here a little bit long term. And I was like really confused. Uh -huh, so sure. I was like, what are we going to do here? Like sure. what? I mean, home is back home. Like, what do you mean we're right. not going back home? Right. Oh. And did you officially say goodbye to friends or No, family? because I wasn't, you I didn't know. know. <laughs> I think wow. my parents and, and brothers had a chance to say, say goodbye, but, uh, we also filed for refugee status basically mm. um, back when we, we left because we left fairly quickly. Um, and so when you file for refugee status, you can go back to your country for another 10 years at the very least or wow. until the process is done. So um, my family and I didn't go back for about 10 years or so. So until I, we became citizens, which was when I was 18. Uh -huh. I was a senior in high school, so okay. um, I did not go to Columbia for a very long time. So Right, um, right. Yeah. So did you take the test? The I did, yeah. Okay. yeah. Did you study for it? I did study. I mean, it was very fresh. I mean, I, I was a senior in college, and mm -hmm. I mean, high school, and I had taken AP US history and mm -hmm. a lot of 
Gov and Econ. So all this stuff was very fresh. But my, but my parents' um, English wasn't as strong as mine. So mm -hmm. I sat with each of them for a month or two every single day going over the questions wow. until they had it right. Okay. So you kind of refreshed your memories too. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I think I became a citizen right around then too. Maybe I was a freshman in college. And unlike you, I thought I had it all figured out. <laughs> I went to school here. I know all this stuff. Yeah, let me just say I almost didn't pass. Oh, yeah. you have <laughs> it to would study. have been very yes. embarrassing. Yes, my parents studied and studied and studied, and their English wasn't as well as you know they could read and write better than they can speak. So for them, they really Same. put in effort, right? Yeah, my parents were good if they're like if we could read it and then pick multiple choice, but it's a it's a oral exam. Right, right. Uh, and they're you know it's very intimidating to have an oral exam for questions about civics and U.S. history and mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence. So mm -hmm. especially if it's your second language, it's a very intimidating process. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And that's really great that you chose to be become a citizen at such a young age because we actually, I'm sure you do too, know a lot of immigrants who are eligible. They have their permanent residence, but they haven't chosen to become a citizen yet. Yeah, no, I, I think you see that more and more often. Um, and I think there's some countries that have limited uh, citizenship as well, like dual citizenship. So mm -hmm, I think that's true. Um, I myself, I know Colombia allows one dual citizenship, so we were able to have both. But I imagine for many folks, especially older, if they've lived in their country for, you know, 20, mm -hmm. 50, 30 years, um, it's hard to kind of say, you know, home isn't home anymore but, and right. say this is my new home. Right. Um, so I, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, Especially, you know, with so much of, of the negative rhetoric that's going around, I think it's hard to say this is, I want to denounce my citizenship mm -hmm. where I know I, I, I am, I belong for a place that not necessarily welcomes me every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a tough, tough for folks to do. So what was it like as a young person? You came, you were with your parents. So was it easy because you were so young that you just kind of started going to school? And did you speak English? I did not speak English. Okay. No, what didn't. was that like? Um, so, I mean, we're in Florida, so I think it, it was interesting because Orlando has a, at the time, not as diverse, but it really does have a decent of amount of, I think it's the second biggest population of like Puerto Ricans, for example, in the U.S. after New York. Wow. Um, and so there was Spanish speaking, but I mean, for me, it was a shock. The Spanish was very different. Um, you know, the Caribbean Spanish is different, mm. so I, I had teachers that spoke completely different than I did. I mean, it wasn't different dialects per se, mm -hmm. but um, it was different, and so I had to get used to that. And the education system in Florida can be a little bit tricky. Uh, Florida's mm. not known for education, that's for sure. Uh, and so I was actually stuck in, in all Spanish classes for about two years, first grade and second grade. Oh, there so was you no went English. ESL. There was some immersion program, right? But oh, okay. there was I wasn't learning any English because oh, yeah. everyone spoke Spanish, my teachers right. and my peers. Right. So what do you think about the uh, the ESL system? I mean, I'm sure there's better ways to do it. <laughs> I don't think that was the best way. I, I didn't learn that much um, English. The only English mm -hmm. I learned was when I was, you know, out uh, playing in the playground with other kids, and uh -huh. I had to learn how to play with them. So uh -huh. I was a uh, you know, resourceful kid who wants to play, so you have to right. learn what to call toys and games. So right. that's kind of how I really learned. Uh -huh. um, and by the time I got to third grade, I think I started actually pushing my parents to take me out and put me in the English speaking classes uh. against the school's advice. Um, wow. Cause the school was like, she's not ready or she's not testing for that. But I remember being like, just like, just I would just want to be in that class. Wow. Because um, I think I felt myself falling behind mm -hmm. in a way because I wasn't learning the same content and I was, and it was you were slower. such a young person <laughs> and you, you were so conscious about that yeah I, I think wow. I, I think I came with a very strong math and science skills okay. um, and so I did really well in math and science and so I, I think I could see when I was like having different math and science curriculum than my peers which doesn't make sense to have just based on language right and I was you know it makes sense for me to be behind in reading right mm. if I don't know the language but not math and science and I was mm. finding myself getting easier mm -hmm. content and, and I was like I don't want easier content in math or science so right. I think that's why I started to get fr uh, very flustered and, and asking my parents and wow. my parents didn't know much about the education system so they were like I mean if you think you 
like want to get out of that class and go to a new one, like we'll sign whatever. So well, they trusted you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they they definitely didn't have much guidance, and they just yeah trusted me. But mm -hmm. I imagine not many parents or mm -hmm. kids will do the same. So mm -hmm. um, I got very lucky in that aspect. So do you have some good pointers in helping people who are not speaking English or learning how to speak it? Any good advice yeah. on how to learn the language and learn it so well that look at where you are today? I mean, of course, the the younger you are, the better because you're you're just more immersed and you're quicker. And I think you're the main thing is about being less risk adverse. Mm. Like you know, don't be scared to kind of jump in there. So much of, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, with kids, it's like we learn the language because we're playing, um, mm -hmm. and and we don't think of it as you know, oh, I'm going to be embarrassed, so I'm going to say a bad thing. And you know, kids kids can be mean and say, you know, yeah, you don't so say it like that. You didn't have any of that experience. I mean, I'm negative? sure I did. I'm sure I did. I remember um, the first time I heard uh, someone, like one of the kids was like going around calling this all everyone like, oh, you guys are nosy, like you guys are nosy, because I don't know, we were like talking to the teacher or something, like trying uh -huh. to like figure out what the teacher, like who she was gonna give the attention to or something. And I remember I didn't know what the word nosy meant. I was like, does he, like, is he saying that I have a big nose? And I remember right. I, I like went home and I was That's like, mom, good. do I have a big nose? And she was like, why are you saying this? <clears throat> and so I was, it was like those things that you get confused uh -huh. by, but uh, uh -huh. I don't know, you're a kid, I don't know. You, you bounce back real quick. <laughs> well, that's good. And clearly you're an optimistic person. So any funny story or uh, a slang or any anything funny food or what, what were some of those early memories? I mean, I think the hardest thing, and I don't know if there's like signs behind this, but uh, learning animals and fruits is very hard for a second language learner, or at least for me in, in that. Huh. You just, That's different fruits, it's very hard to be like, for example, like um, for Latinos, <clears throat> the green lime, mm -hmm. we call them uh, limon, so it's like lemon. lemon and uh -huh. it's really hard for us to learn that it's the opposite. Wow. Um, and I don't know if we had a word for the yellow one and the green one distinctly, but <laughs> if you say lemon to a Latino, they're going to think oh, that's so it's funny. the green one, not the yellow one. <laughs> Uh, wow. And so, yeah, I, I always thought that was super interesting. So for me, I had, I've always had a very hard time with fruits and learning it up all over again. What's your favorite fruit? Watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what do you eat at home? Um, the, like when i back in Florida or here? Back in Florida. Um, there's a ton of Colombian restaurants oh, and okay. do that, but I mean, I love my mom's cooking. And I don't know if it's, yeah. Yeah, it's Colombian, but mm -hmm, <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. home-cooked meals. And now? Um, I mean, I'm by myself. I'm, I definitely don't know how to cook, so I, I work in tech, so I do a lot of pressed juice, mm. smoothies. Um, mm -hmm. I eat out a lot, <laughs> mm. probably more than, than I'd like to, but um, yeah, time is, time is tough. I order, order out. <laughs> well, we do live in a very, very uh, exciting, wonderful area with lots of great food, right? We do. We really do. Yeah. So, I mean, I enjoy, and I love all kinds of food, and every day I have a different, you know, what I'm in the mood for, so I, mm -hmm. I kind of leave it up to how I feel tonight at 8 p.m. to mm -hmm. decide. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll probably work a lot of hours, I would imagine, being in tech? I do, so my job is very flexible in terms of, mm -hmm. it, it, there's a lot of working, but there's different parts to it, and I actually have a lot of flexibility of how I schedule it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do work long hours because uh, there's a lot of events that come after the normal work day, the nine to mm. five, then there's a lot of networking events, a lot of panels and a mm -hmm. lot, just different things to do. Right. And being such a young woman, I mean, 25 years old, uh, look at where you are. I feel like I've lived a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> really Maybe a couple, right? <laughs> I mean, that's really impressive where you came from Colombia as an immigrant, went to school, didn't know how to speak English, and now came out to California, went to Cal, and being featured in Forbes magazine. In fact, I think I did a little checking. Out of the 30 people, you were the second youngest. So, I think so, probably. I think there so was you're a probably consistently, <laughs> right, the young, younger, one of the youngest people yeah, in the room. Definitely. Oh, yeah, and, and venture capital is a uh, much older-leaning industry right. in general. Right. Um, Tell us about how it feels to be not only a young person, but a woman of color and an immigrant. Um, it's tough sometimes. I mean, in any room, usually I am the only woman. I am the youngest, and I am definitely usually the only person of color. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I work in a specific venture capital fund that we focus on immigrant founders. So, um, which I, is so amazing. Yeah, it's it's yeah. really exciting. And and but 
I'm usually not the only person of color in the room, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, technology in general, um, I think the last year about only 2% of venture capital money went to women. Um, wow. And the industry is, I mean, it's under 10% of uh, venture capitals are women. Um, and so, mm. you know, in general, we don't have a lot of women writing checks and we don't have a lot of women entrepreneurs getting checks. So mm -hmm. if you work in tech or if you work in, in venture capital, there's just not a lot of women around. Um, Things are changing, though. Slightly. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think it's still is not quickly enough. I think mm. you know, it's it's not. Um, good for anyone um, to have one race, one gender, one type of age deciding what the future of technology looks like because mm -hmm. um, it impacts all of us. Right? We, all, we all have our smartphones and right. we all you know, watch our streaming and, and yeah. are impacted by all the, the changes that are coming down the pipeline. And right. I think it's important that when you are at a table that is deciding what technology gets the money, mm -hmm. um, you have diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, most people watch the show Shark Tank. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what we do. But if yeah. you don't, it's it's very important. I mean, everyone, no one knows what's going to be successful. Right. Um, and so seeing a pitch or an entrepreneur come to you and say, you know, I have an idea that I'm going to build the next social network, um, then it's, it's important to have different perspectives, uh, mm -hmm. younger perspectives, women, men, just different, different races. Right. Um, because we're, we're a very diverse consumer base, so mm -hmm. why would we not have the same at the investment level? That makes a lot of sense. And do you watch Shark Tank? I do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's entertaining. It's entertaining. It is, it's, it's, it is. it's different, but it's entertaining. So have you noticed the difference from your immigrant uh, founders who you guys fund from the ones that you see on, on Shark Tank? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in general, from immigrant founders to the non-immigrant founders are native born. I mean, I think a statistically says that if you are a uh, foreign born, uh, you're twice as likely as a native born to actually start a business. And this mm -hmm. applies both to technology um, and small business moms and pops. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the main thing is, you know, as an immigrant, you come to this country and you don't know a lot. Uh, you might know only a couple things, right? Whether it's you're a mechanic and you know how to fix cars or mm -hmm. you know really well how to cook and you build your own like restaurant mm -hmm. um, in the case of a lot of tech entrepreneurs that are immigrants they you know they study sometimes undergraduate in, in India and they come here for grad school some mm -hmm. of the best PhD programs in the world and and they really want to stay here mm -hmm. uh, and build a company here and hire people here um, and the one thing is that because of all these v visa issues and mm -hmm. you know you have to have a company sponsor you or you have to have x amount of money x amount of employees to like justify staying here um it's these founders will not let their companies die i mean they mm -hmm. they will work for free they will work unlimited amount of hours mm -hmm. um because for them it's not just if i don't work or if i don't sell this i you know lose my business it's i have to go back home right um i don't get to stay here and so right. that extra pressure is um what really drives them to be way better with their money uh, they're way better with their time. They work so much harder, um, and and I think th and, and it's not like they're it's just teams made of immigrants, right? It's it's uh, usually mixed teams. You have native borns yeah, and immigrant founders, so um, it just everyone works a lot better together, and, and it's great. Huh? So so actually, let's take a moment and talk about Unshackled. Where are you? Where? Yeah, yeah. My, so my fund is called Unshackled Ventures, and we are a pre-seed fund. So that means that we tend to be the first money in um, and we like to find teams of very early stages when they're just thinking about their ideas, when maybe they have a prototype, maybe what we call the minimum viable product um, that they're testing out and learning to see if, if it really is something that their customers or users would like. Um, and we invest up to $500,000. Um, and then we take um, anywhere between 12-15% of equity in the company. Um, we help them with immigration, give them immigration lawyers to support uh, any of the questions and visas and filings that they need. Um, we provide them with a very strong network in Silicon Valley of mm. investors and entrepreneurs that support immigrant founders um, and really believe that they are better for economy, rather, you know, job creators, not job stealers. And, um, and then we just provide them with, with our advice and our guidance and help them um, navigate this very complicated Silicon Valley ecosystem. 
And your tagline of the firm, I think, creating is a one hundred thousand yes, one hundred thousand jobs for Americans. You know, we're, we're hoping you know the more folks that we can get to stay here in this in this country and build their companies here, the the more that creates jobs for everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not like immigrants only hire immigrants. That, you know, right. they hire everyone. And, and that's a very good point. Either those jobs are made here, or they're they're made abroad, and and we have our own companies uh, mm -hmm. competing against them, and and no one wins. It, we want this and this talent to stay here. We want to mm -hmm. have their innovation that they have. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the impact of affordable housing be an issue? for these immigrant founders? Absolutely. I mean, the thing that we see the most common is for founders to move here, one or two founders. But as they start growing their team and hiring engineers and hiring product and marketing and HR, um, it's really hard for them to afford um, a lot of them because it's, it's very expensive. Right. Um, and so what a lot of what we're seeing is actually distributed teams, that we call them. Um, and so you have teams that are now moving to Houston, to Dallas, ah. Texas, to uh, Florida, a ton of folks are moving to Florida. Florida? Um, even Sacramento. Sacramento is a very popular place to have teams at. Um, and so what you see is you'll have one or two main founders, co-founders here mm -hmm. in the Bay Area and, and their teams in engineering and are anywhere else in the U.S. And sometimes yeah. they do have to hire uh, abroad um, if they can't afford what they have here. Um, and usually at the very beginning, early stages of the company, they don't have that much uh, money, but they still have to get a lot of work done. So. Uh, eventually, as they grow, they start kind of coming back to the to the bay because, I mean, there's great talent here. It's just very expensive. Sure, sure. I know. Yeah. And as you know, I worked so many years in the nonprofit industry, and uh, people in nonprofits are finding it very difficult too. Mm -hmm. So I mean, teachers, teachers, teachers well. are uh, first responders, and you know, really, there are just so many people who are actually middle class that can't afford to stay here either. It's awful. Which is, uh, yeah, I know. Do you have any? Good suggestions, or in your opinion, um, I don't. I mean, I myself, I'm, I'm, I'm young <laughs> as well. So I, I think it's very tough for younger folks to think, you know, when will I ever own a home, right? Right. Um, I was reading this study actually today about how the average house in San Jose goes up by eight hundred dollars a day in valuation. Wow. And so, I mean, wow. I would have to save over $800 a day for me to be able to put down a down payment to keep up with just how much houses are going up. Right, um, right. And so, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult for anyone, mm. including uh, younger folks who don't have any money to start off with, right? Mm. I mean, it, maybe your parents can help a little bit, but if you don't have that startup capital mm -hmm. to buy a home, like, I don't know how my generation in the Bay Area is going to afford housing. I know, I know. It's definitely a very... Uh huge issue yeah. and hopefully some of your uh, founders will find an innovative solution hopefully yeah i think solutions. a lot of it has to do with tech a lot of it has to do with policy yeah uh, we need more housing that's for sure and uh -huh. um, a lot of it yeah and i mean for me what i'm thinking of is you know i'll build my career here and hopefully invest money but somewhere else like in florida uh, right. where i can af probably afford a home rent it out have some passive mm. income but um, you know it's still i want to be here so i would love to have money to be here. Right. Yeah. So I'm curious, when we talk about immigrant founders that you, you work with, what, who comes to your mind when I say the word immigrant? I mean, everyone. <laughs> it's, I think that's the interesting thing. Uh, um, we're all immigrants. I mean, most of our founders, um, they really come from all over. I mean, we have Europeans, we have Eastern mm. Europeans. There's a ton of really good tech talent coming out of Eastern Europe. Um, Australians, we have a ton. Uh, obviously, Indian, China, uh -huh. um, a lot from Asia. But I mean, we just see talent growing everywhere. I mean, South America, Central America, mm -hmm. Africa, Canada. Wow. <laughs> There's a ton of Canadian engineers that come, and they have some of the mo the best robotics programs wow. up in Canada. So did not know um, that. Yeah. Huh. So there, I mean, it, everything, it's just, it, there's so much talent from all over the world that wants to come study here, learn here, or be mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. So they do still want to come. They do. Even in current times. They do. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think, um, you know, there, there's the chance that it might not always be the case uh, right. if they don't feel welcomed. And a lot of, of obviously, what's happening on and the political spectrum is limiting a lot of these visas for high-skilled mm. um, immigrants. And so right. um, that, that it probably can deter a couple. But uh -huh. hopefully we don't do that. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, well, as you know, my organization that I started is called You Belong Here Foundation, and I have a consulting practice called You Belong Here. So the sense of belonging is really important to me. And I think one of the best ways for someone, immigrant or not, to feel like they belong in a community is through giving back and getting involved, being engaged in the local community and work on, um, you know, volunteer for local nonprofits or schools or w wherever, but just to be really an active part of the community versus being insulated. So I know we met when you and I both went through the Latino Board Leadership Academy. Yeah. So um, I, I, I was not, obviously, not Latina, but uh, um, they allowed me to go through the program to check it out because I'm very interested in offering something like that for all immigrants beyond uh, Latinos and Lat Latinx, right? So how are you able to fit in board service and volunteerism in your busy, busy, busy life? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, all of us, and it doesn't just apply to immigrants, but of course it applies to immigrants in that we all have something that we can give. We all have skills or we have time. Um, and this is valuable to other folks out there who might not have it or who don't have the skills that we have. So, you know, for me, it's, it's finance or marketing or I know how to build a website. Mm -hmm. in a, I mean, I can build a website in like an hour, a very nice, pretty website, ah. right? And so for me, it's like, that's not a lot for me, but I know a lot right. of folks out there, small businesses right. or nonprofits could use that. Sure. Um, and everyone has that. Sure. There's something that they're good at. I mean, I'm terrible, terrible at event planning, but <laughs> so many folks out there love event planning and that right. is really, and they love bringing people together and cooking mm -hmm. and having events. So um, everyone has something to give in that way. Do you have any suggestions in kind of helping my organization's mission forward and making connections introducing local giving service uh, service opportunities to maybe some of the people, immigrants that you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one thing that for sure the community has is that we all want to give back to folks who are going through similar journeys that we went mm -hmm. through. And I think most of us get to that point a couple of years in, mm -hmm. um, but I have no doubt that we all remember how hard it was and, and one helping hand that, that was there for us and how we want to be that for someone else. There's so much more I want to ask you, but of course our, our time is just about up. I want to give a special shout out to Facing History, a wonderful nonprofit in uh, San Francisco. Well, actually, it's a national organization. So I was at an event last night and was able to uh, take this beautiful, beautiful. table piece back and <laughs> I want to give them a shout out. And I just want to say to all of you that are watching, You Belong Here Foundation is leading a movement of inclusive sisterhood for immigrant women and their champions. We provide resources, training, and community. So please stay tuned, look out for future episodes, and if you have an immigrant story to share, or if you resonated with our mission of infusing positive stories of immigrant women into our community, please join us and check out our website, youbelongherefoundation.org. Thank you so much. What you got inside is the same as all your breath and love. Or you're Asian, African, European, or American Whether you pray to God or atheist is irrelevant Cause what you got inside is the same as all your breath and love